Bob Lustig, San Francisco. Barbara, long time, nice to see you. Um, question for Barbara and Jethro. I want to push you a little bit on one of the questions, the first question that was asked about specific types of tumors that might respond best. I've always assumed, based on the sugar literature, the mitochondrial literature, that the uh, cancers that would respond best to the ketogenic diet would be endodermal cancers, because they require the most energy coming from mitochondria, as opposed to, say, mesodermal cancers like bone and uh, 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 skeletal muscle and fat, or ectodermal cancers like skin. But the fact that the uh, gl glioblastomas seemed, at least in part, to do quite well, despite the fact that it's an ectodermal cancer, gave me pause to think about that. How do you think about the ketogenic diet in terms of cancer specificity and what it's actually doing? Because I heard a lot about efficacy, but I didn't hear a whole lot about mechanism. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that whole area needs to, needs more work. Because like, so as you know, that's my disclaimer, is I'm actually not a cancer biologist. I'm not going to pretend to be one. Right. Um, but my sense from what I know from reading and talking to people is that every cancer is different. And so that makes me a little bit leery of saying some sort of one size fits all well, thing. And I think you're right in the sense that you have to look at the, the metabolism of the individual types of cancer. But we just have so little data on that. I think well, it's going to, go ahead. I'm going to argue that because every cancer is not different because every cancer doesn't have mitochondria. Sorry? Every cancer does not have mitochondria. Every cancer burns glucose for fuel, which is why the ketogenic diet would work, because they can't burn ketones because they don't have mitochondria. It's the Warburg effect. Right. What I've heard, though, is that, well, you know, glucose is regulated. It's only going to go so low. So there's that. You can't really do a lot. You can get glucose down a little, oh. but... You, you the PO, the PO2 think, inside a cancer is 44 tor, so it's pretty darn, you know, hypoxic and hypoglycemic. And there is significant variability in terms of the oxygen level throughout the tumor. So you have regions near the blood vessels that are fairly well oxygenated, may have a PO2 fairly normal to the typical tissue. As you get further from these arduous vessels, it does become lower, and often in the core of the tumor, you do see significant hypoxia. And so, and you're absolutely right, many tumors do have um, significant reductions in mitochondrial uh, content, mass, structure, function across the board, but it is variable. There are certainly data that suggests a variability in this. And so it's, I think we have to learn a lot about the specific tumor of the individual patient. And, um, and we see that certain tumors do have characteristics that seem to cluster together, but even within an individual, you might have a very different metabolic or genetic landscape and hypoxic landscape throughout that tumor. And areas of the tumor might respond differently to a specific treatment. Not to mention the extracellular matrix. Right, yes. if that's getting hijacked by the cancer cells, fueling on ketones, and then fuel, you know what I mean? There's, there's so much interplay to, to say which ones work or don't. Is it, that's a tough question to eat. Yeah. The question of mechanism is absolutely and critically important one. I think you're right. It, it is very pl pleiotropic. Glucose is part of the story. Insulin is part of the story. Signaling cascade, ab you know, changes are, are parts of the story. Oxidative stress changes, epigenetic changes. With cancer, it is a bit of a black box, uh, which makes it interesting to study. <laughs>